Our next presenters are Clayton Nicolardi and Elston Johnson. Mr. Nicolardi is a senior environmental investigator with the TCQ's Texas Optimization Program. TOP is what we call that as short there. And he received his bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin in 2001 after serving three years in the U.S. Army as a tank crewman on the, how do you say that one? M1, oh, it's M1A1, heavy battle tank. Clayton has 20 years of combined experience working in the drinking water and wastewater industries as a, as a TCQ employee and as a TCQ contractor with the University of Texas at Arlington and with Texas Rural Water Association. He has also worked in the private and municipal sectors as an operator and compliance engineer. Clayton currently holds a professional engineering license in Texas and a TCQ license in surface water and wastewater treatment. Mr. Johnson, to my right here, has more than 25 years of experience in the water industry. He has worked 20 years with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, working in various positions and areas of the TCQ. He spent seven years in the Water Supply Division. He is currently working as a contractor for UTA, University of Texas at Arlington, providing support to the TCQ Water Supply Division's regulatory and security programs. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Bioenvironmental Sciences from Texas A&M University and a Master of Science in Environmental Science from the University of Texas at San Antonio. I believe, Mr. Nicolardi, you're going to go first today, or is it Mr. Johnson? We're going to switch up. Going to switch around. All right. Well, please welcome Mr. Elston Johnson. Thanks, Mason. So what Clay and I are going to talk about today is being prepared for um, Weather, severe weather events, but also you can, you can take and be prepared for any event. I think we've heard throughout the morning uh, there's a lot of challenges for water systems. It's, it's hard enough, you know, day to day to run your system, right? And you throw in uh, a winter storm, you throw in the drought we're currently going through, you throw in the random win, uh, severe weather event, and there are challenges that you have to deal with, and so you need to be prepared for them. And so I want to talk a little bit about one of the tools that you can utilize to be a little bit more prepared, and it's mutual aid. All right, so mutual aid basically is getting help from your neighbors. Really, that's, that's basically what it is. Um, mutual aid is something that's been around for a bit. You know, it was really came from the emergency services uh, sector. You know, um, police, fire, EMS. They, they've been using emergency, um, using mutual aid for, for a number of years to help each other out in neighboring jurisdictions or even greater in the regional setting. So here, us in the water sector, I think we started really getting more involved in, in understanding mutual aid about 20 -ish years ago after 9-11 and, and when we started to integrate more with and work more with emergency management folks. And so one thing that we've noticed here lately in some of the talks we've been given and, and um, some of the information we've been when we're interacting with other water systems and folks after winter storm Yuri is that there may be a little bit of a, a gap in quite understanding what, what mutual aid really is and so I'm going to give a very high level discussion of that. I would encourage you to um, come to the workshop at 1 30 today in the San Antonio room where our statewide mutual aid program text run where there'll be a talk a little bit more specific about statewide mutual aid and it'll be get into a little bit more detail and I really encourage you to, to attend that. All right and so mutual aid I won't read it to you but basically it's getting help getting resources after between sharing resources between one party to another. And so the idea of that is to quickly get those resources that are needed to the jurisdiction where there, there is a need. So in case there's an event, you know, we get a storm and you can't, uh, due to the weather, due to uh, power loss, due to uh, impact to your equipment, you know, even during, you know, even we're talking about severe weather, but even a, a cyber attack, you need some help. You need help to be able to do your normal day-to-day -day operations. And so that's where a mutual aid would come in, is, is, is having, please have a plan in place to where you can rapidly get what you need from your neighbors or another system so you can continue your operations. So there are different kinds. Um, there is the local automatic mutual aid, and that's the one where there's in place a, an agreement between two jurisdictions where if, if an incident occurs, and it's 
um, near a neighboring uh, jurisdiction that they can immediately dispatch resources to help out. You see that a lot with EMS, you see that a lot with police and fire where they'll have an agreement in place and so if something happens in their area and it's close to your other jurisdiction that they'll go ahead and they'll dispatch resources and they'll work out everything afterwards. The next one is a little more formal, the local mutual aid between two entities, be it city or district, and they line out a little more in writing um, how to obtain those resources, not as not an automatic dispatch, but there are some things in place that where there's a trigger to where, okay, this event has, has happened and so we need some assistance from our neighbors and they'll go out and they'll, and they'll help you out and then again, you'll sort, things, sort things out afterwards. And then there's a regional or interstate or as I mentioned earlier, statewide. And regional is one where you have a group of jurisdictions, cities, usually these are put together by councils of governments where six, seven, eight entities will get together and they'll decide on what resources they're gonna share, how they're gonna share them, and line out specific triggers and activities and things that happen for, to kick that mutual aid agreement in place and start getting those resources moved to where they need to be. And then the statewide, as I mentioned earlier, is here in Texas, is for water and waste audits, Tex Warren. Um, but there, there's those type of uh, entities, warrants all over the country. And basically, your, your neighbors become the entire state. The, you, you could pull and request resources from anybody in the state, and they have the opportunity to give you assistance. They are all very much vo uh, voluntary. But there is a, uh, some plans put in place, resources that have already been pledged to where an event happens, it can rapidly move those resources to where they need to be. And then of course, there's the interstate, and that's when we have those really bad national, na nationally declared disasters where Texas will go help people in Louisiana or, or vice versa from hurricanes, which we experience a lot here, or if there's other major events, you know, the flooding that's happening up in Kentucky, there's other states going in and helping them with those because it's, it's such a great disaster that's impacting, having a real widespread impact. And so those exist well, where states have, will plan in advance and have, have places and have uh, things staged and have agreements put in place so where they can render aid to each other and provide resources as quickly as possible. And so mutual aid agreements, they are uh, documents, and so documents have parts, and this is just a, 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 just a bullet to summary of the parts of a mutual aid agreement. If you have, have one, you wanna make sure you have these things in place. A lot of it is for um, obviously knowing who does what when, right? What is a mutual aid agreement in place for? What's the purpose and the scope? Is it for um, particular type of incident, or is it for particular types of resources? Those type of things align out in the purpose and scope. And then you have definitions, you know, common terms that will be used throughout the agreement. You want to make sure everybody understands uh, what things mean so there's no miscommunications or misunderstandings. And then you have the roles and responsibilities. As I mentioned earlier, who's doing what? That's, that's the key for that. To make these things work, they have to, that has to be lined out before the incident occurs. And so get that together in your mutual aid agreement uh, is key. And then, um, of course, there is the expenditure of resources, right? And so there has to be provisions in place for reimbursement of the jurisdiction that uh, responded and provided aid from the ones, the jurisdiction that received aid. And so that's all lined out uh, in mutual aid agreements as well. And this is all the information I'm getting is coming from the National uh, Incident Management Guide that the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA put out in 2017. And it's a uh, few updates, but it's, it's basically uh, still the, the way things are lined out and how they define things. All right, so additional things in the mutual aid agreement, there is also insurance, right? Um, people are out working, things can happen, so those things have to be lined out in agreement as well. And then as the, the actual, um, if, you know, when things happen, right? We go out and we do these things, we're working, with other folks uh, doing different things than we normally do, and things can, um, can happen, and there can be some, unfortunately, some disputes that can happen or, or disagreements on things. So the agreement needs to line out how those things are reconciled and how, how things get solved if there's uh, a dispute or misunderstanding of, of something that occurred during the response and implementation of the mutual aid agreement. And then there's, 
uh, workers' compensation because you will have, you know, staff out there working and it will be during work hours and after hours and so those things need to be lined out on how that's on how that's going to operate and how that's going to work and who who's responsible for what and then of course is there is there a limit on the on the agreement um, is it going to go on for five years ten years forever the, that also needs to be put in place and and defined in the document and then the, the big key part of it is the operational plan. Um, a good mutual, mutual aid agreement will have an operational plan, and that lines out very specific things about how do you respond, how do you communicate, what, what resources are you going to supply, um, also training. Uh, you want to make sure that these things, these activities you put in place on paper and you learn, that you write down, that they actually work. And so uh, you want to have in there uh, provisions for doing uh, tabletop exercises or doing training events with multiple jurisdictions so that everyone knows how to interact and work with each other. So jumping from mutual aid to state assistance, that's the second part. So in Texas, well, I feel like we're pretty fortunate. We have a very uh, robust uh, state emergency management program um, and uh, Texas Division of Emergency Managers have a lot of resources and, and they're very capable. And so there's a process to request uh, that type of assistance. And so um, I'll run down that a little quickly. This diagram kind of explains how, how things should flow. And so you want to try to, if you have an event, you want to try to address it at the, the, at the local level first. And so you want to, if you're in an area where you have uh, a, a municipality that possibly has it, their own emergency management uh, organization, you want to go to them first to try to get assistance. If you're in an area where they don't have that, then your next step would be your county. Most counties have some sort of uh, uh, county emergency management, maybe run by the judge, but they, they may have a few folks that are available or know how to get resources together for that assistance. Um, but you want to you uh, start at those two lower levels. But if, 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 you're, if you can't get the assistance you need at, at the city and county level, then that's when you want to request that assistance from the state of Texas. And so you do that through, through your county, through your, uh, either your emergency manager coordinator or your county judge, and you, you request that assistance. The state has a, what they call a STAR, state uh, assistance request form. That, um, that you can utilize, and using that form, you, you provide that to your uh, jurisdiction, your county, and then it'll move up to the state operation system if needed. And so this is the um, login page for how to do it electronically. Uh, it's on, T on Texas Division Emergency Management website, but this is a star request form uh, web, web page. You go in. You put in your information. It automatically uh, knows kind of where you are based on the information you put in, and so it'll make suggestions on who, on what uh, county or jurisdiction you should go to to request assistance. And so it's in the the web link is in the, the slides that, in the packet that you'll have. Uh, and I checked it just a few days ago, and it's still working the same way. And if you have an event where you can't get assistance at your municipal or uh, county level then you can go through this process to fill out the information and to get the assistance that you need. So with that, I'm going to step back and let uh, Clayton take over and talk about the preparation, specific preparation activities you can take. I was hoping Elston would go longer, but um, <laughs> no, anyway. Um, it's, Nice to see you all. There's several folks' faces I notice, recognize out in the crowd. Uh, those of you who I've worked with in the past, you know, uh, whether it's a, you know, responding to an emergency or whether it's just routine, you know, uh, treatment stuff. So I got thrown into this, um, you know, emergency preparedness, like many of you all did. And Brittany, my boss, right here. We were talking about one day winter storm Uri is just a, I mean, it's a bad topic around my house. And it's, you know, it's, it's a sore topic around uh, Brittany's house too. But, you know, we learned a lot through the storm. We learned that we can't control everything. 
You know, there, you know, some guy told me you can, everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something. And so, you know, I think emergency preparedness comes in a lot of different flavors in Texas, whether that's, a, you know, responding to, you know, a hurricane, a tornado, you know, a winter storm like Yuri that kicked our rear end. So um, I'm going to go over just a, a few things. I'm going to try not to read down the list, but there are things that we can do uh, to better, better prepare ourselves. Oftentimes in the work that we do, it's like whack-a-mole, you know. So we're going to put out fire after fire after fire, literally. And so, um, and sometimes we learn from our mistakes and how we could prepare better, um, you know, for our future. I, I don't know if Benjamin Franklin actually, actually coined this. I think my mother said it too. <laughs> so I was the, the master of procrastination. So the night before the term paper is due, staying up all night. So that's a little ironic that I'm giving a, you know, a topic on preparing for disaster. So, you know, here's just a, a you know, list of a few of the disasters that we could, we can face. Something I don't have in there is cyber, you know, attacks. So that's obviously something, you know, that we concern ourselves with today is someone cracking into our SCADA system and being able to make a uh, process control adjustments to the equipment, feeding equipment that we have and pumps. I think the, the important part of preparing, setting any preparation plan, and this is part of your EPP, and so you're dealing with, you guys are dealing with some of this already, but is to identify your critical, critical infrastructure. This thing's cutting in and out, I'm not really sure why but uh, you guys bear with me. So is to identify what your critical infrastructure is. And that's not gonna be everything at your treatment plant. I mean, if you're looking at a diesel generator and thinking it's gonna run every single thing at your plant, we're not gonna fool the operators in here. You know better than that. But so you first have to identify what your critical infrastructure is. And that's anything that if it goes out is gonna, is gonna prevent you from uh, distributing your product, which is drinking water. You guys have the most important, in my mind, important job uh, in the state, uh, in the world actually, treating water. Many of you guys drink the own water that you treat. Your families drink that water, your kids, your grandkids. So what you do, we do not take for granted. So these are just, a, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the things that may show up on your list. Okay, again, identify the potential risk. If you're, if you're in, say, the panhandle, you're probably not concerned about, you know, gale force winds from a hurricane. Now, a tornado, it's a possibility, but you're not really concerned about a hurricane. So not, it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. We, we try to put things, compartmentalize things and put them on a list so that we can check them off. And we live in Texas. I mean, every region's different. So you need to develop, of course, the EPP, and that's what you guys are working on. That's a requirement. But clearly define who's going to be responsible for that critical infrastructure. Oftentimes, we see a lack of communication. When, I, when top goes out in the field, it's usually kind of picking up the pieces. You know, I mean, it's things have kind of gotten, you know, bad and so we're out there trying to identify troubleshoot what the problems are and and come up with solutions um, oftentimes we see a lack of communication between uh, it could be within the same department well the distribution guys aren't communicating with the treatment guys you know and it's just communication is key but having those that can take a management responsibility for your critical infrastructure to make th make sure maintenance, preventative maintenance occurs, and then it occurs at the frequency recommended by the manufacturer, and uh, and that it gets done correctly. I don't know where I stole this one, but I'm always good if I see something good. You know, uh, I've been known to steal jokes and and steal slides, so I don't know who put this one out there. If you're in the room, I apologize. I didn't get you know. Uh, 
your approval before I put it on there. But I love this. This is, uh, you know, I grew up in East Texas, country boy. Um, so I've seen stuff like this, actually. <laughs> I'm not saying I took part in it, but I have seen it. Um, so Elston eloquently went over, you know, his part of the presentation, which included, he, he, he mentioned this part of it. You know, you guys, the water systems don't typically, when you get into an emergency situation, aren't going to contact the TCQ or the EPA right away. I mean, the idea is that it's, it's local. You know, you start with your local level, and that's really where the rubber meets the road. You know, if you're waiting on the TCQ or the EPA to tell you exactly what to do, then, you know, you're going to be waiting, and, you know, you're going to miss the window of opportunity to respond in a timely manner. So this begins with your local uh, emergency uh, officials. That could be your fire department, you know, I mean, just police department, sheriff's department, and those kind of things. And I like this slide, I added it. This is actually part of the EPA guidance. And so this shows you how it kind of starts in the center and you move out. Uh, communication, um, obviously communication with your emergency responders. Also, if you have emergency interconnections with, uh, with other water systems that maybe they didn't get hit by the tornado. It s took a swath right through your treatment plant and knocked you out, but you still had that con interconnection with, with a local water system and emergency interconnection. So it, it's, it's good that you keep clear communication. Also know where to get a hold of those folks and when uh, should something arise. Okay. So gathering resources. This is obviously a very important part of preparation. You know that right now supply chains, you know, with, with chlorine, uh, with certain chemicals, you know, some folks are having a hard time, you know, with purchasing chemical. And uh, we've had some water systems that wanted to conduct a conversion go back to free chlorine, but they were concerned that, you know, that they couldn't get the amount of free chlorine they needed to, to, to go past break point and run a conversion. And, but if, if you can, with a tornado, it's hard to prepare, but, you know, you need to have a certain amount of chemicals on standby just in case an emergency happens. And so, you know, having a 15-day supply of chemicals it is good if you've got that infrastructure uh, to support that. You know, availability to portable generators, you know, where you could, um, if you lose electricity at a well or at your surface plant, you know, that you can have, <clears throat> you can, you know, at least send some water to town, you know, especially if there's a fire, you know, we need to, to produce that water. Um, reagents. When you're going, getting ready for hurricane season, so the coastal regions, a lot of the operators down at plants along the coast start prepping for hurricane season, and that's you know additional reagents, uh, additional chemicals on site, and so they're preparing themselves even before uh, you see all these folks on the Weather Channel. Drives me crazy, you know they're they're talking about it for days and days and days and days, and you know tracking it. But you know, I mean, it's good to 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 help us understand that we need to prep. A first aid kits and bottled water and things like that. So when your operators are maybe stuck at the treatment plant, treatment facility, they have a place to sleep. Hey, I've slept on the floor during during a Hurricane Harvey um, in a in a lab room. You know, just didn't have you know use my backpack for something to lay my head on. But you know, having having cots and having something, food, MREs and things like that for your staff. It's very important. Um, also, you know, getting your staff ready in terms of, you know, you know that you're going to have to put more people uh, on duty to prepare for emergencies uh, during emergencies and actually responding, you know, after the fact to, to what uh, damage you may have in your system. So getting ahead of that, and uh, there's a thing called, um, and, I, and I'm just, I'm losing my mind right now. I'm trying to think of it, but it's actually, it's, it's uh, operator fatigue. So if you know what operator fatigue is, anybody in, 
in here knows, raise your hand if you know what operator fatigue is. Okay. And so, you know, if you're working 36 hours, you know, and you're trying to, to, to do effective job, you know, at some point you reach the point of diminishing returns and you don't, your decisions become, uh, you know, less efficient and become more dangerous. And so whenever you're scheduling people, kind of have that, that plan in place that, that you can rotate folks and prevent this operator fatigue because you can lose somebody, somebody can lose their life over a poor decision when you're dealing with water and, and wastewater. It's just a fact. I mean, there's a lot of chemicals that can kill you. Um, there's a lot of pumps and, you know, electrical circuits that can, can kill you. Uh, you can stage, you know, vehicles and, uh, you know, uh, fuel, uh, excessive fuel, you know, just to, to have that in storage. Remembering that uh, diesel, you guys know if you had diesel generators, you know, um, it can get contaminated with water, right, from condensation inside the tank, and then it also can get biological contamination. So, you know, storing fuel, you need to also have maintenance. Um, if you turn that generator on, it's got a bunch of water in the tank or contaminated fuel that can run your generator. You know, during Harvey, I remember this, uh, I responded to Ike, let's see, it was Ike, Rita, and Harvey, I don't know the order. Uh, Brittany knows better than I, she was in Beaumont at the time. But I responded to all three of those. And one of the, th one of the issues was, man, just access. I mean, you had to have a chainsaw. And then I'm talking about, when I'm talking about trees in East Texas, big trees, oak trees, and pines, I mean, it was almost impossible to, to get to where we wanted to go. But I think it's important to, you know, to keep your right-of-ways clear where you can uh, ingress and egress uh, your facilities. Also make sure trees don't fall down on, <laughs> on a transformer or a switch gear or something like that. So you need to be, uh, you know, keeping your accesses, you know, maintained right away. Uh, again, refuel generators if you can. I understand that if you hold so much, you know, you're holding, you know, diesel fuel for a while, you know, it's not like gasoline. Gasoline, you can hold it much longer without it getting contaminated, but, but uh, diesel is susceptible. E you know, even, uh, even the diesel you put in your truck's got some biodiesel in it. I mean, it's maybe a, a small percent, but biodiesel is real susceptible to con uh, biological contamination. Okay, we talked about 15 day supply. Okay, now, you may feed chemicals that are just for taste and odor. Say, for example, I feed, you know, activated carbon or something. It may just be from an aesthetic standpoint, you treat with taste and odor. Now, when we talk about preparation for an emergency event, you know, the critical chemicals, if you're a surface water treatment plant, are gonna be a coagulant, right? I mean, last thing you wanna run out is your coagulant or your polymer if you're feeding a coagulant or you know, flock aid or something, and disinfection. Um, so you need to make sure that you have uh, additional supply of those particular chemicals. You can get away with having something, that, you know, the water may taste or smell a little funny, but if you're meeting inactivation, you know, you're removing those pathogens, inactivating those pathogens, uh, you know, you can still, you can still move forward. Uh, insulate. Uh, a lot of the talks, discussions about uh, about insulating pipes. Now, when elect you've got heat tape and you got electrical, you know, electricity, you lose electricity. Heat tape's not going to do any good. But there are a lot of systems that um, that I've seen out there that are poorly insulated. In other words, they did a repair, they took the insulation off that was pretty good insulation, and then in its place they just do what I call in East Texas just uh, redneck ingenuity. Um, it, but redneck ingenuity is actually uh, pretty good stuff. I practiced a lot of it and it's actually worked. Duct tape and bailing wire works great. Um, but, you know, have alternative sources for, for that power, you know. Have, you know, propane, butane, or certain uh, things that we can, we can add that will help us through 
a disaster. Not going to cover every. You guys have access, I believe, to this. I don't know, Mason, right? They've got okay. So you guys can go back and, and look at some of these slides. Um, I, I always put this slide. I don't know how many t presentations I put this slide in here, and I apologize. Y'all probably seen it a hundred times, but you know we talk about uh, the reason I put this in here is during during uh, winter storm Uri. Um, there were some vents that were completely iced over. Okay, so the vent on top of a storage tank, you know, when, when, when the pumps pull suction on that tank, when your high service pumps pull suction on, on that tank, and the vent is clogged, and the vent is blocked by ice formation, um, this can occur. Now, in this situation, it wasn't ice. In this situation, it was that you know, they had pigeons nesting there or whatever they had. They weren't maintaining this tank and the vent was not breathing. So when the pumps pulled suction on that storage tank, it just, like a can. All right. That's what it did to the pump building. So the operators were just in there before this happened. So you see what it did to that building. You know the power of water, okay? It's amazing. So make sure that, you know, your vents, you know, or from when you go back online or you're going, you make sure those vents are clear of ice and debris and things, right? Protect exposed pipes. I mean, this seems like a common sense deal. I think probably a lot of folks in here prepped. But again, not everybody put the right insulation on. There were some folks that no matter what they put on, it was still going to freeze. That's how cold it was. It was minus seven in Tyler, where I live. Minus seven. Uh, sample stations and dead end or flush valves, those were a lot of, uh, you guys in here have, uh, uh, when I was working for Tyler, we had a lot of fire hydrants that were private. So they were on a, in, inside a business. And so the city didn't own and operate the fire hydrant. But a lot of those broke, and we had lost a lot of water that way. Also, uh, flush valves that are above grade. So uh, there were a lot of uh, dead ends that, that actually broke. Sample stations for sampling water. Water crossings. Who in here had any water crossings uh, freeze up, lines going across? We had some of those, even uh, as large as like 10 or 12 inches, which it absolutely amazed me to, see, to hear that a line that big froze. Okay. Generator preparation. This is something I've been uh, involved in, trying to put together some, some guidance for, you know, how to take care of your generator. Uh, there was a lot of folks that had generators, but guess what? They were, they were not maintained. When they went out there to, to, to turn them on, they, did, they either didn't work or the fuel source was contaminated. And so it caused large... When, when you put contaminated fuel into a fuel system, what happens? I mean, it, it causes lots of problems, right? So... How can you test for fuel contaminations? Well, some companies can come out and actually polish your fuel so they remove the, uh, the bacteriological contamination in the water. Uh, you can also, water uh, will sink to the bottom. So I would suggest take an old mason jar and, and you know, catch that first flush off the drain into a mason jar. And uh, if it's clear, and that's a diesel tank, then you know that's water in that tank. That's what's going to happen. So uh, this is just a simple way, just the East Tech, you know, country boy way to do these things. All right. Electrical facility prep uh, preparation or protection. Uh, there are some folks that had switch gears that hadn't been maintained, and so um, they weren't able to switch over or didn't switch over automatically. Some of that had to do with, uh, there were some gaps in communication between whether Encore, you know, or the water system was responsible for it. I think that's part of the communication deal. If 
find out what your critical infrastructure is and find out how you can keep it going. Um, there were some folks that were using UPS, um, uninter uninterrupted power systems. So there were some folks carrying around generators, portable generators, to charge their UPSs up because UPS systems don't, they won't stay charged very long, but this, you know, runs your, maybe your SCADA system and certain controls you need to maintain operations. So guys, I know you have a lot of this stuff already. Obviously, check thermostats. Uh, close up the pneumonia holes, that's what I call them. So we always talk about when we're riding down the, the road about 65, um, and it's cold outside, I'd always say roll that pneumonia hole up. So just make sure you know that you're you know, keeping things insulated and you know, hey, don't, don't do this at home. I always got to throw this caveat in there. I was out in the field and I saw it was an ingenious idea. It was a redneck ingenuity, you know, moment. The guys at the plant, they took a, they took a, a barrel, a 55 gallon metal drum barrel and put oak, oak in it and put it and lowered it down into their pump room. Now I'm not, I'm not telling you guys to do this. And they set a fire and they kept their they kept their pump room warm. Now, you know, for one, that can cause a number of problems, like you know, fires for one, uh, you know, oxygen deficient environments, you know, and uh, and you don't want to do that in a chlorine feed room. But what I'm saying is, people get kind of, you know, use ingenuity. And what I was talking about with insulation is this is a funny picture. I take pictures wherever I go, and when I do see something funny, um, I tend to take pictures. Okay, so, you know, they have removed the, the insulation off, and, and so what happens when that gets wet? I mean, that's the insulation you put in your attic, right? Which is not supposed to get wet. So, the, the you know, good, good, uh, good idea, just poor implementation maybe. I don't know. And I know I didn't cover every bulleted item, but I, you know, I, I hope that you guys, you know, I've had fun with this um, emergency response. It's allowed me to meet a lot of good operators and meet a lot of new people uh, across the state. And, um, and I hope that we can be a resource um, to you all uh, operators, because I know we've, we've kind of lived it and, and, and we're not perfect, and we don't know all the answers. You know, we're real good at responding to hurricanes, this, this freezing stuff. I mean, we're not from Iowa or Minnesota. Uh, so let's all learn together. And uh, we would love to have your ideas, too. If, you know, I, I'm going to be at the conference for, you know, till Wednesday. And so if there's something that you did, it's your water system that wasn't on the presentation and that you felt got you through the storm. That's helpful information for us so we can help other people. That's what it's all about. We pass that knowledge along. And that's all I have. Do we have?